Welcome to the Bill Kelly Podcast, critical discussions in critical times. Here's your host, Bill Kelly. And welcome to another edition of the Bill Kelly Podcast, critical discussions in critical times. I'm your host, Bill Kelly. Uh, There's been a lot of concern, a lot of misinformation, a lot of uh, stuff flying all over the place about what's going on in the Middle East in the last couple of days. Uh, You know, what happened, who who shot the, the missile or was it even a missile? Uh, at the hospital in Gaza, uh, how many casualties actually were there? And uh, is this always the case? I know it's an old cliche, but it seems very apt based on what we've seen happen so far, that uh, in, in war, the first casualty is truth. And that seems to be happening once again. So I had a million questions about this. And our next guest, uh, I think very aptly, uh, put a lot of our concerns into context in an op-ed piece he uh, had published in the Ottawa Citizen uh, just a couple of days ago. He is Phil Gursky, president and CEO of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting, and of course, a former CSIS analyst. Phil, great to have you back with us. Thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, Bill. I see the guest twice in, in the course of a week. I don't know what to say. <laughs> well, the world is spinning. Some would suggest out of control these days because of all the things that are happening. And and as you've talked to us about before, and I think you cover this in, in a number of the books that you've written, uh, we've got to be very careful about exactly what we absorb and what we believe to be true. And I think this this, first of all, the war between Israel and Gaza is is the, the context for that. But then you had this, this missile attack on this hospital, and immediately Hamas says, well, that was an Israeli. And, and, and half the world, it seemed, all of a sudden said, oh, okay, that was. That's because they said it was. And I'm, I'm shaking my head as, as I'm listening to this information, thinking, this is Hamas. Now all of a sudden they're a credible source for information. And, of course, there have been contradictions about this. And, and I, I saw a piece uh, just today uh, that suggested that uh, the and I know Biden was over there talking about this and said that he's got credible evidence that says this was not Israeli stuff. How do you sift through this? I mean, you were you were an analyst. You get this plethora of information or misinformation, and the truth, I guess, is in there someplace, isn't it? Yeah, you you raise a good point. So you know, as as you pointed out, I worked thirty two years in intelligence in Canada, both in what's called SIG and signals intelligence and mm-hmm. in human intelligence or human. You worked in the news for decades as well, Bill. And you know you're only as good as the accuracy of the, in, of the information you use to base your opinions. And it, it is a challenge. I think it's more of a challenge nowadays in the sense that, you know, disinformation and misinformation is rampant. Much more so, I think, than when I started out my intelligence career, you know, way back in the early 80s. And so what, what you need to do, and I get a lot of people ask me this, this, this same question, is that how do you know what to rely on? And and I think there's some things you can use. There, there, there are currently or I think traditionally sources that one would deem as reliable. And let me just throw a few names out there. Sure. The BBC, the BBC uh, Reuters. Uh, these are organizations that are around, in, in cases of Reuters, for well over a century. And they do their best to corroborate their information from sources they deem to be reliable and truthful sources. The problem is, is that on the one hand, we, we, we fortunately live in an age of infinite information and you know you, you and i both remember the days before the internet bill oh, yeah you got your information from the daily newspaper which you had to go and pick up or get delivered to your house now you're a few clicks away from just about anything you want to know the problem is is that 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 flood of information uh is also full of a lot of a lot of crap a lot of absolute shit when it comes to you know being being truthful and you know we in intelligence try to make sure that our sources were reliable as possible do we get a perfect absolutely not but you raise a really good point with respect, I think, to the to the missile attack or rocket attack or whatever it is on, in the hospital in Gaza. The Israelis say it was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad missile that went awry. The Hamas says it was an Israeli airstrike. The truth is somewhere either on either side or in the middle. And I think it's a real challenge for people. And, the, and to compound that, people go in with their preconceived biases. You know, we saw the pro-Hamas demonstrations here in Canada. So as far as many people are concerned, um, Hamas is right, Israel is wrong. On the other side, Israel is right and Hamas is wrong. So when you, I think when you combine the information, misinformation, disinformation with your own, um, prejudices and biases, that makes it even more difficult. And they realize the problem. And, you know, I, I and I, as we talk today, I mean, I don't just definitively say, well, now we know what happened. Here's the truth. And that all, the rest of that is all bullshit. We, we know that there's still some gray areas and still some questions that have to be asked. But as I tried to pull myself back and, and watch this from afar, if you can do that in the world these days, what surprised me, first of all, was how quickly some people wanted to embrace that scenario. Uh, and, and I'm like, okay, 
there's a lot of people out there that, and you've talked about this uh, in, in some of the other op-eds that you've written. Uh, one of the, 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 I think, very troublesome things that we see in, in the political world these days is there's an extreme left and an extreme right that have a louder voice these days. Um, and you would think, okay, they're polar opposites. They're going to have polar opposite points of view. Uh, but one commonality they seem to have is is, is a, a, an anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic theme. Uh, and we see that in the demonstrations from the extreme left and the extreme right. So when the, when a, something like this comes out and Hamas says it's them, the Israelis did this, they jump at that because they want to believe that that's there, even if it isn't. You're absolutely right. You know, anti-Semitism is, is almost as old as Judaism, I think. There seems to be this long-standing conspiracy theories that, you know, Jews control the world or seek to control the world. And, mm-hmm. you know, they point to cases of, of very wealthy people who happen to be Jewish and say, hey, there's my proof kind of thing. But you do point out something very interesting, Bill, about this really curious relationship between the far left and the far right, where, you know, um, the anti-Semitism rules on both sides. So the far right, of course, you know, neo-fascists are part of the far right. We know what neo-fascists are. The Nazis were fascists, and they yeah. obviously tried to exterminate Judaism from Europe back in the 1930s and 1940s. And on the far left, it seems to be more of an intellectual anti-Semitism, like on university campuses. And it seems to be embodied, as far as I understand it, and you know that I'm not a specialist in the far left, but it seems to be embodied in the state of Israel. Israel is uh, doing bad things. It is, you know, incarcerating Palestinians. I, I, I've seen constantly, Bill, over the past couple of weeks, references to the genocide in the West Bank and the mm-hmm. genocide in, in Gaza, and I'm thinking, do you guys actually know what the word genocide means? I, you know, it means the deliberate killing of a people with the express intent of eliminating all of them. And so I think these words get used very, very loosely uh, to support, again, as I said earlier, a preconceived bias or a, a prejudice against a particular people. But it does, it, it is an odd marriage when you think about it. And unfortunately, um, your average Jewish person is, again, caught in the middle, subject to hatred from both sides of the political spectrum. Well, those are buzzwords. And, and if you want to make an impact, especially on social media, where there don't seem to be any guardrails, uh, you want to use words like genocide. You want to use words like, uh, well, the, the buzzwords of this thing. You know, And you know that all of a sudden people are going to gravitate to that. Uh, and, well, terrorist, there's another one. Uh, you and I have talked about this in the past. I mean, the CBC is on the hot seat, and I th- as they should be, I think, uh, for a memo that was leaked. It essentially told their reporters, don't use the word terrorist. <laughs> well, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, <laughs> it's a fucking duck. Come on, people. What is, I don't understand this, Phil. I mean, you know, when, when they, a, a number of people from Hamas, uh, and they're not quiet private citizens, run across the border and start indiscriminately murdering babies, women, walking in, knocking on doors, opening the door, and just shooting people. What if that's not terrorism? What is it? You know, it's funny. You Are they freedom fighters? I don't well, think so. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because I did read the CBC editor in chief or whatever the, whatever his name is his explanation for that. And by the way, the BBC came up with something very similar. And you know, okay, they made some points. I understand it. It was a very intellectual argument. But what I walked away with, uh, having read these things, is that. You're just you're just making excuses for mistakes that were made, and you're absolutely right. A group like Hamas has been what we call a listed entity in Canada for a very long time. So when I was at CSIS uh, way back in the you know post nine eleven days, we were asked through what was then Public Safety Canada or maybe it was Solicitor General back then I forget to come up with an actual list of terrorist entities which could be used in legal proceedings. So if you know if you send a check to Hamas and Hamas is a terrorist entity, you can be charged with terrorist financing. And Hamas has been on that list for a very, very long time. So even the Canadian government recognizes that Hamas is a terrorist group. Now, in fairness to the Trudeau government, he did use the word, the T word, in, re- in referring to Hamas. And, you know, there was a big debate in Parliament. I think I just read about this morning how the government says, well, the CBC is independent. We can't tell them what to do. Fair enough. But as you said, I mean, this is the proverbial terrorist duck. <laughs> and and for people to, to, I'm not sure why we're tiptoeing around it. Like, who who are we afraid of offending here, Bill? If we call Hamas a terrorist group, is anybody going to go? Will there be demonstrations in in Hamilton or Ottawa? Because I, I think Hamas what they're doing, though, Phil, and you talked about this a, a little while ago, it's it's what they're doing is conflating Palestinians with Hamas. Uh, and and again, you know, if you're a Palestinian, uh, you you must be a member of Hamas. You must support them. Uh, and and conversely, you know, if, if, and and what it is, it's it's muddying the waters. 
uh, for whatever purposes they have. I don't know if it's out of ignorance or if there's a, an agenda at place here. Uh, but we keep talking about some. The prime minister has made these points too in his comments. That and Biden talked about it extensively when he's over in the Middle East uh, earlier this week. Uh, that not everybody that lives in Gaza or in Palestine is is a supporter of Hamas. Um, and and the, we have to make that distinction. But I guess we get lazy sometimes and just figure they're all bad people. Yeah, you know, you mentioned earlier, and I agree with you, that often truth is the first casualty of war. I will say there's a, a second casualty of war, Bill, and that's nuance, is that when you get in that situation, things are black or they're white. You know, we talked about Fifty Shades of Grey last time. We won't go down that pathway again. Good. But there, there really is a difference, and you're absolutely right. So, uh, you know, for your listeners' benefit, I mean, the Gaza Strip has been controlled by Hamas for a very long time. So they essentially are the government of, of, of Gaza Strip. Whether or not the elections were free or fair is completely irrelevant. That does not mean that every person, I think there's, is it two, the population I think is 2 million in the Gaza Strip last time I checked. Mm. doesn't mean you've got 2 million Hamas members, supporters, terrorists living in the Gaza Strip. And But I think that people want to categorize and, and they want to, you know, to paint everybody with the same brush. And we've seen it on the other side as well, where, you know, Jewish settlers are terrorists by definition. Now, I'm not a big fan of, of the of the illegal settlements in the West Bank. I think it's exacerbating the situation. And there have been incidents where people have carried out acts of violence against Palestinians living in the West Bank, including murdering them. I would call that terrorism. I'd call it Jewish terrorism. But th- there's so many fine gradations in terms of who is who in the zoo. And I think, you know, in terms of, of consuming information, and more importantly, speaking, putting my old analyst hat on, to do proper analysis, you have to engage in, in various t- shades of nuance. If you don't do that, you can simply get things wrong. And 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 that's what confuses, I guess, because you know, we, I think we as a society have, have well, we've become lazy. We read headlines, we don't go into details. We get okay, I've made up my mind, uh, and now I'm going to go back online now, and I'm going to find all the articles uh, that have been uploaded that substantiate what I've already decided and want to feel about this. And and it's 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 problematic like that. You're absolutely right. And I, I guess what bothers me about this is when I look at this and and. And I figured, okay, technically, Israel has been out of Gaza for some time now. They said, okay, you're self-governing. We're here. We're going to get pissed off if we see more incursions across the border. So they had, quote, unquote, free elections. They elected a government. Hamas, as you say, just, you know, like a, a, just went in there and consumed. The, the, they said now they've run the whole operation. Yeah. Uh, so some people think that you can equate, okay, everything in Palestine yeah. and everybody in uh, Palestinian uh, in Gaza there. Are, are terrorists, and that's not true. Yeah. And when you hear some people commenting about the, the god awful conditions and the sorts of things that are going on in Gaza, it's true. But I don't hear too many people saying, "You know what? It's Hamas that's doing it to them." Uh, you know, they're responsible. It, the Hamas uh, organization they're responsible for taking an awful lot of Palestinians and herding them into camps. Uh, they're responsible for the living conditions. They're responsible yeah. for the yeah. fact that a lot of the money, the aid that's supposed to be going there, is going to buy military equipment yeah. as opposed to feeding people. Yet they don't. That doesn't seem to be part of the discussion. Yeah. And and the other side of the coin, I I'm not a fan of Netanyahu, never have been. And don't forget, until this crisis that was going on, they were ready to not only charge him but convict him of yeah. some horrific crimes. Yeah. It, it's not a matter of he might lose his job. He was going to go to jail. Yeah. Uh, now all of a sudden that's been shoved mm-hmm. to the side. So there's. There's there's a lot of guilt and a lot of crap going on on both sides here. Yeah, you know, bottom line is Hamas doesn't give a rat's ass about the Palestinians. No, they're, they're, they're a terrorist group that only have their own purposes. I, I like the, your use of the term "lazy bill," and when it refers to you know the, our discussion about what information do you rely upon, what do you use, people are lazy, and you know people only read the headlines or they get something scrolling on their on their iPhones and they look at one line and. And like you said, then they go down the rabbit hole. It's like if you ever watch YouTube, Bill, you watch a video and then immediately there's a set of recommendations on the right-hand side. And those recommendations are based on an algorithm that if you like this, you're going to like this even more. But if you yeah. go down that right-hand side, the further and further you go down that rabbit hole, things get more and more extreme, I find. Look, you and I are, you know, old, older Canadians, I'll use the term, who have lots of time. I still spend three or four hours a day reading. And I read a multiplicity mm-hmm. of sources around the world, only because that's why I've been intelligent for 32 years. I know that everyone can't do that. Everyone you know, doesn't have the luxury of you and I sitting with a cup of coffee all day and reading the newspaper. But if you truly want to be informed in 2023, you have to get out of that lazy habit of, of either relying on one or two sources or simply skimming headlines. You have to actually ask some serious questions and then identify and follow people, organizations, news outlets 
that will give you the subtlety and the nuance that we've been talking about. If you don't do that, you're going to get things wrong. And and I think that especially in times like now with the emotion level at off the scale, and you've already seen the accusations about the Gaza, uh, the attack on the uh, hospital in Gaza. Half the Arab world is out in that war. There's going to be probably demonstrations and riots. A lot of you know countries like Morocco are immediately blaming Israel, despite the fact I'm sure they don't have any evidence to, you know, one way or the other. But I think especially in times like today, where people are very, very upset, and for legitimate reasons, that's the time where you want to get more nuanced, and you want to get better informed, because you're not thinking straight. You're not thinking properly, because your your dander is up, and, and emotions got the better of you. But if, if, if at that point, you simply don't do your homework, um, you're just going to contribute more to the problem and not to the solution. Uh, just, I'm going to swing back to, to the op-ed piece that was in the uh, the Citizen, uh, where you talk about this, and, and the world right now, including the Canadian government, apparently, is is I think justifiably, uh, you know, focused on what's going on in the Middle East. And, you know, that's a powder keg uh, that could explode; it could go either way. But in all of this, of course, is is not Canada's role necessarily in what's happening, but in the dissemination of information. And we've always, you know, pumped our chest that hey, we're part of the Five Eyes. You know, we've got some of the best. Uh, you know, military intelligence and, and, and surveillance anywhere in the world. And the Israelis were apparently were at the top of the heap. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to ask you about that in a second, too, about how this initial attack happened. But in all of this, of course, was the testimony from the CSIS chief that opened up uh, in parliamentary hearings and simply said, hey, this is important, guys, but don't take your eye off the ball. We're still getting screwed by China. <laughs> and that was supposed to be what we were talking about. When you asked me to come to parliament, it was to talk about this. That's and, and he said, that's still our number one threat. And nobody in Ottawa seems to be paying attention. It's a great point. You know, as I, think, I think I may have said last podcast, it was the British guy who said, what keeps you up at night? Events, dear boy, events. And things are just changing so rapidly. So, you know, the context is, is that there was a conference in the United Kingdom just the last couple of days where the head of the Five Eyes, so Australia, Canada, Great Britain, New Zealand, the United States, head of the security service got together. And the public statement that came out, and it was the head of MI5, which is the British security service, yeah. which is the CISA's equivalent in the United Kingdom, Great intelligence organization, by the way. I have many friends who work there. Said it's it's really China, and, and so when you work in intelligence, you have the challenge of, of looking at multiple things simultaneously, and that's a whole other conversation about resources and money and all that kind of stuff. But you know, when we talk about China, they are the elephants in the room, or is it the giant panda in the room? I don't want to get racist here at all, Bill, and you know, talk about panda bears in China. But um, a few months ago, we had these these leaks to the Global Mail about uh, CISA's concern about Chinese activities, that the government was told in, in black and white China's doing X, Y, or Z, interfered in our elections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The government immediately ignored, what, what, not immediately, the government ignored the intelligence for years, and they immediately came out and said, well, uh, I didn't see it, or it wasn't important kind of thing. And then if you recall, we had this just the Justice Rulo Commission, which came out with a complete ball of shit in terms of you know absolving the government of any blame in this regard and actually yeah. putting the blame back on the intelligence services and then we were promised a second inquiry what have you heard lately about the second inquiry bill i don't see it anywhere in the news and um the government's going to use the current situation in gaza and the international tensions to put this on the back uh plate again on the back burner we're not going to hear about it and as a consequence nothing's going to happen and you know who's laughing all the way to the bank china because yep. they've gotten away with it yet again, and they realize Canada's not serious about monitoring their activities in Canada. And so, well, as we're watching, you know, the bombs fly and, and Biden meeting with Netanyahu. Uh, if you watch the rest of that newscast, gang, um, you'll notice that there was a meeting uh, that same week with Putin and and Xi in China. And um, I know they probably said, "You see what these idiots are doing in the Middle East?" But they're they're falling for it. Did we not have a discussion, Phil, years and years ago about the immediate threats? Uh, that were going on and cyber threats, etc. And you've identified, and CSIS has identified, and CIA has identified Russia, China, and Iran as yeah. the three major players. There are yeah. others, but they're the three big ones uh, that that are really they're the they're pulling the puppet strings here. Uh, you know, it it may be Hamas that's doing this, but they, where do they get their money from? And I have heard virtually no discussion yeah. about Tehran's part in this whole thing. Yeah. Do you think yeah. these guys would have done this unilaterally? Uh, without the money and the okay and the heads up from this? They, well, I, I think that as Western nations especially, we have a problem with a squirrel. Something happens and we immediately turn our attention to something. But you're absolutely right. You look at who the major players have been for 
not years, but for decades. And they're the Russians, the Chinese, to a lesser extent, the North Koreans, the Iranians. We, we in intelligence knew that. We provided the intelligence to our clients. But there was a lack of attention, a lack of interest. Uh, they moved on to the next thing. Maybe, maybe they got bored kind of thing. But, you know, these countries don't change their, their modus operandi, uh, despite the fact we think they do. So let me tell you a story, Bill. Sure. You know, I, 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 I started my career during the Cold War back in the early 1980s. And, and when I worked for CSE, which is Canada Signals Intelligence Organization, we were all about the Cold War. All about, you know, Soviet missiles, Soviet activity, Soviet intelligence, all that kind of thing. And then, of course, the Cold War came to an end in the late 80s, early 90s. The Berlin Wall fell, the Soviet Union dissolved, and we essentially declared victory. We remember the first President Bush's thousand points of light. I mean, the yeah. world has changed, and it was kind of like almost like a World War II moment, right? Nazi Germany has been defeated, so has Japan. And maybe people drew the false analogy that just like, you know, Germany and Japan developed into modern Western oriented economic powerhouses in the 1960s and 70s, maybe Russia would follow along. And we kind of embraced Russia and said, we'll kind of help you along. Uh, you know, they became a partner of ours in counterterrorism after 9-11. I was in Moscow talking to our former adversaries, you know, the, the successors of the KGB about counterterrorism issues. And yet at the same time, I mean, you know, and, and you can go back and say, well, if this had happened differently, if Yeltsin had done this, whatever kind of thing. But the bottom line is Russia didn't change. And under Putin, it's gone back to the exact same kind of activity it did under under the, the, the communist days. And, well, and, that, and that's his motive separate anyway. He wants to reunite the Soviet Union, doesn't he? Well, exactly. But the, 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 the more the stranger question is, why didn't we see that? And we didn't see it, Bill, because we we didn't look for it. And 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 then I I'm gonna you know I'm not gonna cast the blame solely on the intelligence services, but we as Western societies thought, okay, been there, done that. Got the T-shirt. The Cold War is over. We won. We declared victory. Let's move on to something else. And we let our guard down in the same way that Israel let us guard down against Hamas. And we'll get to that I think in a few minutes is that you have to realize that people and nations rarely change the way they view the world. So, you know, what Russia's doing now is completely synchronous with what the Soviet Union was trying to do for the better part of 75 years. And our inability to recognize that is is, is very worrisome, absolutely. Two elements about this, and and again, I'll go back to my media background, and I'm, I'm a voracious reader like you are, fiction and fact. Uh, I, I like Tom Clancy. I'm sure you've read the mm-hmm. Jack Ryan books. <clears throat> uh, and the series, by the way, on Paramount's really good, but I, as a side. But e- even in, in Clear and Present Danger, uh, and I know Clancy does a lot of research in this, They talk, it, essentially Jack Ryan's going in there and they're taking out a, a, a training camp, a terrorist training camp. Uh, do, do, do they still exist? I mean, because one of the things we've heard, Phil, uh, once this, the invasion and the bloodthirsty invasion that happened in Israel a couple of weeks ago now, is this looked like a very coordinated attempt. Well, they didn't just put it on a napkin and say, let's give this a run. you got to know that they were trained to do this. They had training sites. They probably had dry runs on this. Where the hell do you think it happened, and who do you think helped them? I mean, yeah. that's, those training facilities for terrorists have been going on for, as you say, generations. Why have we forgotten about them? Why does nobody talk about that? Yeah, it, it, it's a great point. Now, you may have noticed within the past 48 hours, the head of Shin Bet, which is the Israeli internal security service, again, people that I have a great deal of respect for, he's he's fallen on the sword. He said, my bad, my service didn't pick up on this. Mm-hmm. What I have heard, the analysis that I have read in open source is, is that it was basically in part a failure of imagination and a, and a part of misinterpretation of what they were, they were actively monitoring Hamas activities in, in the Gaza and they simply thought it was something else. And, they, and there were people within Israel who really felt that Hamas had had, had its day in the sun and was no longer the threat <clears> that, that it once posed in the early 80s and 1990s. And as a consequence, when you convince yourself that something doesn't pose a threat, you interpret events and actions on the ground very, very differently. Um, now, to Hamas's credit, they were careful. My understanding is that they, they didn't use a lot of cell phones, so, so your signal's intelligence isn't going to work if you're not calling somebody. They think very, they think very carefully. They kind of hid their activities as construction activities, all that kind of stuff. But we can't forget, too, Bill, that Israel's been, as you said earlier with Netanyahu, um, Israel's been riven with protests over the past couple of months, over the Supreme mm-hmm. Court, over Netanyahu. Uh, there's reports of reservists not reporting for duty because they hate the government so much. It's a very far-right government. So I think it was a, a stew of, of very uh, various ingredients that led to their, their failure to detect what Hamas was planning. And, you know... You can see the information, you can collect the information, but if you've got other things on the on, on the on the front of your mind, you don't take the time to analyze it properly. So I don't like the term failure of intelligence because I think it's oversimplistic. 
but there's no question that somebody or somebodies uh, failed to understand and appreciate what Hamas was planning. Because like you said, they were doing it actually quite openly for a period of time. And they're still getting their money from Iran and other partners. They're still running terrorist training camps. And this was done more or less in, in, the, in, this, in, the, in plain day. And for whatever reason, or the reasons I already cited, uh, they failed to pick up on what it all meant. But as you said, some of the best uh, propaganda or misinformation, as we, I think we term these days, mm-hmm. uh, has a, a very slim factual base. And you simply take that. Um, it seemed as if there was a, a, a hole in the intelligence with the Israelis. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen some of the things on social media, on, on Instagram and on, on X these last little while that said, the Israelis knew about this. They let it happen because they it would justify them invading into Gaza, which is bullshit, of course. Yeah. But you take that, and all of a sudden, that catches on like wildfire in the social media and simply reinforces the, the hate, the anti-Semitism that's going on there. Uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of time, as I mentioned a little while ago, for Netanyahu. Uh, I, I think you know he's 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 Donald Trump on steroids, quite frankly. Yeah. When if yeah. you want to use that comparison, uh, but I don't see him allowing this sort of thing to happen, so he can justify that. If if, if a, an Israeli prime minister wanted to justify these sorts of incursions, they just go ahead and do it. Yeah. Uh, they they don't need that sort of thing going on. But now yeah. all of a sudden, that's that's a theme on social yeah. media right now because some people just want to believe. That these guys are bad, and that they, they would sacrifice, yeah. you know, their own people to try to justify this. Yet, when you turn that around and said, "Yeah, but Hamas will sacrifice," them. no, 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 they're all Palestinians. Yeah. In other words, they, they, we can't believe that they did something wrong. It had to be the t- guys that we don't like already. There's no way the most cynical leader on the planet in a Western-style democracy would admit the possibility or open the door to 1,400 casualties to justify a re-incursion invasion of Gaza. I mean, anybody who believes that really needs that. To- but they're the same ones, Phil, that said 9-11 was an inside job, the CIA was involved yeah. in this, yada, yada, yada. Well, you know, and, you, and now you're talking conspiracy theories, of course, and that's a really interesting phenomenon that a lot of people have started to look at. Like, why do conspiracy theories start? Why are they so uh, tenacious? Why do people hold on them for long periods of time? But again, and it goes back to our earlier point, is that you know, if you really want to understand what's happening in the world, it, first of all, that's a challenge. You know, we said that, you know, earlier you and I are old enough to remember the pre-internet days when news, you know, came in from the slow boat from China. Unless that's a racist phrase these days, I don't know. And you had to, you know, you had to consume things very, very carefully. Now we're, we're inundated. And I may have used this line before with you, Bill, but when I was at CSC, the Seattle's Intelligence Organization, for a year I was the head of collection and, and data flow. And my data flow manager used to say to me, we can't keep up. And this is the 90s. We can't keep up with collection. It's like drink, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Well, the analogy today, Bill, is drinking from Niagara Falls. I mean, there's just so much information out there. You can't consume it all. It's simply impossible. You know, you, you've probably heard the term the Renaissance man, right? Back in the Renaissance, you could know almost everything because there was just mm-hmm. so little available. Well, no one can be a Renaissance person anymore. And, and I think that, you know, not only is there that much more information from a variety of sources, but there's a disinformation, misinformation that we've been talking about. So it is a challenge for the average person to try to decide, what do I read? What do I follow? What do I believe? And how do I use that to form my own opinions? I, I don't envy uh, anybody these days trying to do that. I think there are ways to, to get better at it. But you're right. And, and then you've got the uh, you know, people on both sides with their positions. And the problem is, is that, and I was having a conversation with a friend the other day, like, it's, you know, you look at a spectrum, you look at the far left, the far right, and you've got the middle. The problem nowadays, it seems, is that the middle is, is, almost, is almost abandoned. You're either mm-hmm. here or you're here, and nobody is here. And that's where the rational arguments are being held. That's where they, we can agree to disagree, have you know a civil debate. Nobody wants to be there anymore because they're so entrenched in their positions on the far right or the far left. And as a consequence, um, we're not getting anywhere. So where, where do we go in a situation like this? You know, I, I point to the Biden visit to, in, the, in the meetings with Netanyahu. and uh, you know, Biden's been involved in, in international politics for many, many years, I guess about 50 years. Uh, in the Senate, he was the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee for years and years and years. So we met with all of these people. Uh, he was vice president under Obama uh, for eight years and, of course, carried on that role. And now he's doing it as president. Uh, and, and and he said, you know, to justify, you know, I've had a long relationship with Netanyahu. Uh, but it's been an acrimonious relationship. It's pretty clear that he doesn't like him. Uh, but he's the head of, of, of the Israeli government. And, and you know, we're allies, so we're going to have to try to find a way to make this work. Uh, so you've got that uh, as part of the context here of what's going on. Uh, where he, they're coming to their aid because it's the right thing to do, and and you know there's the concern about Middle East terrorism, etc. But why don't the people that that criticize Biden or Netanyahu or both of them, 
in situations like that, not understand that those alliances are happening on the other side. You know, where does Hezbollah get their money? Where does yeah. uh, Hamas get their money? Where do they get their training? Uh, and I know that, you know, clearly they're better. But we also know, for instance, you know, when we hear these stories about all these thousands of innocents that are, are getting killed, and that's a horrific byproduct of, of the shit that's going on there right now. But from previous intelligence, we also know that, that Hamas do set up military operations in schools and in hospitals. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the, the, when these missile attacks started, or these rocket attacks started years and years ago, yeah. they they were uh, uh, tops of hospitals. That's where they're yeah. firing the rockets from. Yeah. Now, I'm not suggesting that justifies the Israelis firing and blowing the whole thing to pieces. Uh, but at the same time, you have to understand that they do use people as yeah. human shields in situations like this. Yeah. And and that doesn't seem to, to be part of the conversation a lot of the time because they don't want it to be part of the conversation. You and and it, 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 it only makes a, that polarizing situation even more polarizing. You hit the nail on the head, Bill. People see what they want to see and they hear what they want to hear. And you're absolutely right, is that there's ample evidence that Hamas and other organizations will operate within civilian areas, use people as human shields, use hospitals, playgrounds, schools, etc. as bases to launch missiles. But that fact simply, it, it doesn't just get ignored, it gets rejected because it doesn't fit your narrative. And I think that's one of the dangers we're in right now is that people are so entrenched and married to their particular narrative is that they don't even acknowledge the, the possibility that there's information out there that may be counter to their narrative. And when you get to that point, you're basically in an echo chamber. And this is something that I, I found out when I, when I worked in Islamist terrorism uh, at CSIS for 15 years, and we talked about this radicalization process that you and I have talked about on the show an awful lot. Essentially, what you're doing is you're sealing yourself in an echo chamber. And that does two things. First of all, it prevents information from the outside from getting in, and it only lets you hear information from the inside, which simply reinforces the views that, are, that you want to believe or that a person's trying to make you believe. And that's where we are right now, is that there is no dialogue. There is no uh, acceptance that the other part, um, party may have a point of view that's worth listening to. Again, we can agree to disagree, but at least we're listening to each other, and we're, we're well past that right now. And people are simply saying, I, you know, Bernard Lewis, um, famous American academic, had a great line after 9-11, and it kind of d described terrorism. And his line was, I'm right, you're wrong, go to hell. In other words, um, everything I say is correct. Everything you say is incorrect. I'm not going to give you the time of day. I'm not going to listen to you. And that seems to be, to be where we are now. You pointed out, and, and I agree, there are ample reasons to be critical of the Netanyahu government. And I sincerely hope that once all this shit is over in, in Gaza, we return to those charges against Netanyahu mm -hmm. because the Israeli government is not a good government right now. It's not good to the Israeli people. We have to set that aside now because they are faced with this threat. But my fear is that, you know, conspiracy theories aside, that this particular um, series of events right now is going to set aside Netanyahu's legal problems and his challenges to the Supreme Court in the same way that, When's the last time you heard about the PRC inquiry in Canada, right? Again, yeah. it's, it, it's been shunted to the side and we're not going to hear about it ever again. If, if we were smart, we would say, let's deal with this right now. Then we'll pick up where we, where we left off before this thing happened. I'm not confident we're going to do that, but I, you know, I, I hope that the standard heads prevail in this regard. Well, as, as you've written about in a number of books and we've talked about it on our show for many, many years, uh, one of the biggest trick, political tricks, of course, is to say, we're going to investigate that. We're going to strike a commission and they're going to do a report on that. And, and, and hopefully people will forget, uh, by next week as the news cycle going at the rate that it does. And, and if that report ever does come, it's just going to get shoved in the bottom of somebody's drawer or someplace. Up in Can Ottawa, Canada Ottawa. must have a record bill for royal commissions or royal inquiries. We have yeah. one every, every second day, it seems. And what do they, and what do they come up with? Not volumes not of information that don't go anywhere. Exactly. Phil, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I always appreciate it. Hope to be back a third time as well. Thank you, Bill. Well, hey, listen, you're on. Okay. <laughs> Phil Gursky, uh, of course, uh, uh, from uh, Borealis. Uh, and, and, and by the way, uh, the, the important stuff here is is what's going on and to try to sift through that. And you're uh, incredible insight into what's going on, Phil. We'll talk again soon. Take care. Okay. Thank you, Bill. That's it for this edition of the Bill Kelly Podcast. Uh, check it out anywhere. Spread the word. Uh, we're ramping it up. Things are happening in the world these days. Middle East and so many other different areas. And we want to talk about this and we want to give you uh, diverse opinions and start the dialogue, which is something that's so key to this. And we'll do that on the next edition of the Bill Kelly Podcast. Until then, take care. We'll see you soon. This podcast was brought to you by Rebecca Wizens and her team at Wizens Law. Rebecca Wizens is a 20-time winner of the Hamilton Reader's Choice Awards for their exceptional client care 
and legal practice specializing in personal injury, car accidents, accidental falls, and Wilson Estates. Now, if you or a loved one have been seriously injured, or if you want to make sure that your family is taken care of for the future with the will and powers of attorney, call Rebecca Wizens, 905-522-1102 for a free consultation. When life happens, you can rely on Rebecca Wizens on Wizens Law. And trust me, Rebecca is my wife, and I don't know what I'd do without her. That's Wizens Law, 905 905- 522-1102 for a free consultation. Subscribe to my Substack for timely news updates and commentary straight to your inbox. Let's keep the conversation going. I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. Let me know what you think we should be talking about next by contacting me through my website at www.billkelly.co. Thanks for tuning in. This is Bill Kelly. Till next time, you take care. Bye.